I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Foley Institute, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event today. This is uh, the second in our, our uh, events running up to the midterm elections. We had, of course, Lisa Brown here on Monday. Today we have uh, Stuart Elway, uh, who's been analyzing public opinion in the Northwest since before most of you in this room were born. <laughs> he's, been, he's been analyzing it since 1975. He's the president of Elway Associates, or excuse me, Elway Research Inc., which is based in Seattle. Uh, and there he's directed uh, literally hundreds of public opinion uh, surveys and research projects uh, and market analyses. Stewart publishes the Elway Poll, which is a nonpartisan independent analysis of public opinion in the Northwest. And he's directed the Seattle Times Washington Poll since 1984. Uh, his, uh, his poll is actually given an A-plus rating by uh, 538. It's one of the few local polls to be rated that high. Uh, Stuart holds a Ph.D. in communications and a B.A. in uh, political science from uh, Lesser University across the other side of the state, <laughs> which we won't mention. Join me now in welcoming Stuart Elway. I want to have a red shirt today. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. You know, as you uh, drive or fly across the state, you today I have a window seat, which I don't usually, and it's a beautiful day. And it's just remarkable the, the, the geographical and topographical, that's a, that's a word, landscape you cross in this as you come across the state. And uh, today I want to talk about the, the political landscape. Um, and uh, just as a uh, warning at the beginning, no predictions. Um, I'm telling Cornell earlier, I usually make my predictions about the end of November. Yeah, <laughs> uh, about a 90% rate, you know, so that's pretty good. Um, well, among the the aftershocks of the 2016 election. I've been telling people since the, the 2016 campaign that 50 years from now, the historians are going to be having a ball with this era we're in. But those of us living through it, it's a little more difficult to understand what's going on. It might take more than 50 years, I'm starting to realize. It might be longer than that before we get a good perspective on this, this era. But the, the aftershock here in Washington State was that our political map may be changing. Um, so this is the classical um, political map in Washington. This, this is the, the 2012 uh, presidential election. This is what Washington State looks like in everybody's mind who follows this stuff. Uh, red on the east side of the state, blue on the west side, except for Lewis County, uh, which uh, juts out there in the western Washington. But that that's pretty classic. The, this, this cascade curtain has been the, the uh, standard meme for decades in Washington, in Washington State. But uh, this year that got shaken up as uh, Donald Trump carried counties along the coast um, that had not, including my old home in the town of Grace Harbor, uh, that had not gone Republican since Herbert Hoover. Uh, and, you know, that worked out pretty well for him, so they thought they'd try it again. <laughs> um, Jefferson County doesn't really count because nobody really lives on that side. Of it. it's, uh, it's really a Puget Sound County, it just happens to run over there. So um, uh, the, the Washington State results mirrored the national results in many ways. Uh, first of all, and I'll come back to this, 54% of the voters in Washington State live in the three counties of Pierce, King, and Snohomish County, between essentially Everett and Tacoma. Um, Clinton won 407, 487 out of the 3,200 counties in the country, uh, which is 16% of the counties, but she won 48% of the vote and 64% of the country's gross domestic product. Um, in Washington, uh, uh, the same pattern happened where the, the Republicans won the acres and the Democrats won the votes. Uh, Trump won 27 of 39 counties in Washington state. He got 38% of the vote. He won 25 of the 26 least prosperous counties uh, in the state. There were 22 counties in Washington state 
that voted three for three uh, for president, governor, and senator, uh, three for three Republican, and that represented 22% of the vote. They were all in eastern Washington, except for uh, Lewis County. Uh, there were n nine counties out of 39 that voted three for three Democrats at the top of the ticket. They got 66%. That, that represents 66% of the vote in Washington State. The legislature is more <coughs> evenly divided. Washington's been a blue state for a long time. It was 1980, in the 80s, the last time we voted for a Republican or a, uh, for either president or uh, governor in the state. But the legislature is a different story. There are 49 legislative districts. <coughs> 21 of those are represented by three Democrats in the legislature. 21, or t 21 Democrat. 20 of them are represented by three Republicans in the legislature. Eight are purple. Of those eight, four are two to one Democrat and four are two to one Republican. So it couldn't be much closer than that. Um, so, and I'll get back to that too, but that looks like it, it may be starting to change. So we've got, the, the question is becoming, is the Cascade Curtain uh, becoming more of an urban-rural divide. Um, the uh, Bill Bishop's 20, 208 book, The Big Sort, talked about how people are, are voting with their feet and dividing into areas that uh, uh, vote the same geographically. Um, so is that happening here in Washington and is, is this shifting? So, <laughs> I'm not without some skills. In <laughs> okay. So uh, these are uh, regions that the Elway poll, we've been doing the Elway poll, a monthly and now a quarterly poll since 1992. And we look at these regions of the state. So Eastern Washington, we have a 509 area code, 20% of the voters of the state. North Sound, which is essentially Snohomish County to Whatcom, 20% uh, of the vote. King County is 30% of the state's vote, 10 of it's in, in Seattle. Uh, Pierce County with Kitsap is 15%, and then 17% is the, the coastal counties, Western Washington. So I started to look at some different questions other than just um, uh, ask over the last year. I've asked a series of about 20 questions. So, uh, and I'll go, I'm going to go through those by regions uh, quickly. I'm going to pack, try to pack a lot into my 30 minutes here. Um, so these regions generally agree uh, majorities on the same side on question, the following question. The country's headed in the wrong direction. We can all agree to that. Elected officials don't care about people like me. We all agree to that. <laughs> Political correctness stifles free speech and debate. We agree. Uh, the economy is unfair. We agree. Uh, we just disagree on which way it's unfair. Um, there's too much wealth at the top. We agree. Government policies favor cities over rural areas. We, we agree across the state. Immigration strengthens the United States. The, the regions agree. Taxes actually are more good than bad because they pay for things we need. Across the region, across the state, the regions tend to agree on that question. Um, on, when we get to things like the role of government, um, then it starts to change. Sh uh, should the U.S. protect U.S. industries uh, or promote free trade? Um, Seattle, so there's my regions across the top. In Pierce County and along the coast, so western Washington, outside of, uh, largely outside of Puget Sound, south of Puget Sound, there's, there's a, there's a uh, stronger sentiment for protectionism. Environmental regulations are worth the cost. Everybody agrees with that, except Eastern Washington. <laughs> um, <laughs> gun laws, uh, should the priority be the gun owner rights or preventing violence? Um, uh, no means that, uh, no, against, uh, no against gun owner rights. So Seattle and King County, no. Eastern Washington, yes. North Sound, no. Coast, yes. So Western Washington, no. Eastern Washington, and with, the, with allies in Pierce County, say yes, we should, priority should be gun owner rights. What, what contributes more to the US, United States success? Uh, adherence to longstanding principles or its adaptability to change? 
Um, everywhere except East Washington say it is uh, adaptability to change. And East Washington, well, they're split in Pearson along the coast, but uh, East Washington is, is a majority say it's adherence it's to longstanding principles. Um, so when we get to the areas of government's role and, and personal responsibility, uh, the government controls, I'm just going to go down, government controls too much of our daily lives. Public assistance is too easy to get. Um, it is uh, more likely that irresponsible people will get government assistance than it is that needy people will go without it. Um, government is always wasteful. Government should not guarantee food and shelter to people. Um, the uh, uh, person's uh, uh, Personal characteristics have more to do uh, with uh, holding them back than racial discrimination for minorities. Uh, the, the, and likewise, uh, persons uh, more to blame for their own, if they're in poverty, they're more likely to be blamed. Uh, blamed is themselves rather than societal or, um, um, factors. Here, um, uh, as you see, uh, Seattle, and Eastern Washington agree zero times on any of those questions. Uh, along the coast, tend to agree uh, uh, line with Eastern Washington. Along King County, which is uh, what we used to call suburban King County, King County outside Seattle, aligned um, five out of seven times with Seattle, as is the, the North Puget Sound. So the, that the creeping suburban going upward back to that. Um, so what we'll see later is that when we look at areas, there's all these splits. The partisans, Republicans and Democrats, don't agree on any of this stuff, any of this stuff, um, except the, uh, that political correctness stifles free speech and elected people don't care about me. Partisans <laughs> both agree on that. <laughs> Which is uh, interesting. Um, so I, I started to try to explore what got called the politics of resentment. Uh, Catherine Kramer's book of this year I recommend to you. It's a study of Wisconsin, but a lot of similarities uh, to Washington State and certainly national, looking at resentments between urban and rural uh, folks. So um, I asked the question about a number of groups uh, going down the side there. Rural residents, Seattle people, uh, the Democratic Party, people on the other side of the mountains, <laughs> uh, the news media, the Republic Republican Party, and Donald Trump. And the question I asked was, what do these, pe do these people um, respect me? Not what do I think of them, but what do they think of me? Uh, as, as, as a r rough indicator of sort of this, this politics of, uh, of resentment. So it's a, it's a broad indicator, it's suggestive, certainly not definitive, but um, for most Washington voters, they thought that they are viewed favorably by people in rural areas and Seattle people and the Democratic Party. So those are the top three there. I'm, I, I'm viewed favorably by those groups. Most people think they are viewed unfavorably by the Republican Party and Donald Trump. Most people in the state. Media is a split. <clears throat> so by types of community now, here's another here's a, yet another split. Big cities, small cities, suburbans, town, small towns, and rural areas. Um, Everywhere but rural, most people think Trump has an unfavorable view of them, every place in this state. Rural people think they are seen favorably only by other rural people and by Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, uh, everywhere but small towns, most people think the GOP has an unfavorable uh, view of them. And it's even more so in suburb suburbs than it is uh, in the big uh, counties. So the, also, you know, again, the rural areas of the state were negative, a net negative. Uh, that number in the middle is how many people said they thought they had a favorable view, favorable view minus how many thought it was an uh, unfavorable 
comfortable for you. So, for example, in suburbs and Trumps, that number is minus 53. It's a net negative of 53 points. Um, rural uh, respondents in our surveys were net negative on um, five or seven. The largest being um, the media. And then the next largest being the yeah, folks. So in the, in the, as looking at in the political landscape, moving in, these were done earlier in the year, so it sort of sets up this election that we're about to have. The Republican Party views me favorably. The only people in my poll who thought that were Eastern Washington residents, people in small towns, and people in legislative districts that Trump won. The Democratic Party views me favorably. Seattle, the suburbs, big cities, King County outside Seattle, the, the, the districts that Clinton won, the counties along the close, coast, the counties on the North Sound, Puget, uh, Pierce County, people in small towns, and people in small cities. So the, the, if there's a politics of resentment, it's not working uh, in favor of the, uh, the Republicans. So now let's look at the, the partisan divides. Another book I would recommend, Alan Abramowitz's new book on the Great Alignment. Um, he looks at uh, national elections survey data and exit polls going back to the 60s and concludes that the parties have been sorting themselves for decades and become, they have become increasingly aligned in response to growing racial, economic, cultural, and ideological divisions in American society. His contention is there is no disconnect between the electeds and the voters, that the elected uh, people are representing a very divided country. And goes further to say there is no center, um, that there's a, there's, there are shifting uh, majorities, but there, there's not much, there, he says there's no center left to talk about. So it's a, it's a provocative read. Um, so here in Washington State, this is my favorite chart. Uh, as you know, in Washington State, you don't have to register by party in order to vote. The only time you have to declare your party affiliation is when I call you on the phone and I ask you what it is, which I've been doing every month since 1992. Um, and uh, the, the chart behind this is the one that's fun, because it looks like just a bowl of spaghetti. So I, I uh, 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 rounded out the curves a little bit. Um, and so this, this only goes back to 2000, when the parties were essentially in parity. Uh, they were even. I used, to, I used to be able to say that Washington, uh, in terms of party identification, was one-third, 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 and independents are the largest third. Um, <laughs> I was a math maker. Um, so, uh, but no longer the case. Uh, the, the Democrat ID started to take off. Uh, right after the 2000 election. The Republican Party skated along and then started to slide in about 2006, going into the 28, 2008 election, and um, uh, has uh, bottomed out uh, at around 25%. Typically what happens, because it's a, uh, the party ID is a dynamic here, because it changes in t month by month, is that in off years, odd numbered years, when I ask this uh, question, even in October, there are more independents than Democrats, and, in, and Republicans are down in the 20s. Uh, independents and, and, and Democrats are at 40s and the high 30s. So in an odd year, that's what it's more independents. And that's what's reflected there lately. When I'm, when I, uh, we're about, I'm here about two weeks early for my, la my latest uh, my round of polling for this election. But when I ask it this November, or October, I'm going to expect what I've seen every other October is the independents and the Democrats trade places. As we get close to the election, more independents decide, well, I'm really Democrat, uh, at least for the next month. And so uh, and the Democrats uh, won the elections. So it's like, they lure the Republicans in with all these independents, you know, and then when they get close, they hoist the Jolly Roger. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Republicans scurry off to Ohio and spend their money over there. Um, so, uh, 
Back to my, my uh, 20 attitudinal questions, a lot of which I stole from Pew, by the way. Um, the partisans tend to agree that government favors cities over the rural, that most elections don't care about me, that political correctness stifles speech. That fuels both Trump and Bernie, uh, that, those two questions, I think, that, that this disaffection that voters feel toward elected officials. And th that there's too much wealth at the top. It, it, Republicans and Democrats agree about that. Partisans disagree, and mostly what this is, is Democrats agree and Republicans are kind of split on whether we ought to have an active foreign policy or a more, isol uh, more isolation-oriented foreign policy, uh, that the economy is unfair, that the idea about taxes being uh, mostly positive. We start to lose Republicans now. Um, and um, that immigration strengthens the, Uni the United States. Democrats strongly agree, Republicans uh, kind of split on that question, actually. Then, uh, the, the partisans are deeply divided when we start to talk about government role and, government's role and personal responsibility type of issues, largely. Um, and, and the direction of the country. Republicans think it's swell, at least they did earlier in this year. That basis of the U.S. success being uh, adaptability or adherence to principle. The, the, these charts are all blues, all big majority, and reds, all big majority, the, the other way. So this is what I mean by deeply divided. Government controls too much of our daily lives. Can't get many Republicans to disagree with that. Uh, the issue of gun control, uh, government assistance is uh, too easy to get. Uh, the determinants of poverty, is it more societal and systemic or is it more personal? Uh, government should guarantee a safety net. Um, it is, which is easier, which is more likely to happen, that needy people go without assistance they need or that undeserving people get assistance that they don't deserve. Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, divide on that. And uh, racial discrimination holds minorities down. Republicans and Democrats disagree on that in this in our state. So, the question we've all been asking ourselves, is the blue wave coming? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, the res uh, in response to uh, uh, how do you, this was, this was back in the spring, so at the beginning of the campaign, uh, how do you resp uh, what's your <coughs> response to the Republicans now control the White House and both houses of Congress? Uh, what do you think about that? Um, so back the top one is April of, th of this year. Uh, Twenty seven percent were either enthusiastic or satisfied. The bottom one is the same period in the in '09, so in the Obama administration, um, and so then. As we see, uh, 70 plus percent are either disappointed, worried, or angry uh, when going to this election. So as we see, what we see in, with these waves that everybody's talking about, you see a lot of indications early, like this, that man, people are unhappy, uh, the Republicans are in power, uh, this is going to be a wave election. Um, and then, when, then during the summer, it usually sorts of, sort of quiets down, and so uh, then starts to, uh, from where we are now to the election, if there's going to be a way, we'll see it now. Um, and it'll really start to set up. And we've seen evidence all year long through the primaries and special elections and all of that. <clears throat> Would you, are you more inclined to vote for a candidate who supports or opposes Donald Trump? Uh, no surprise at the bottom here, uh, 92 percent. The actual surprise is the 3 percent of the Democrats who would going to vote for someone who supports Donald Trump. <laughs> Maybe they um, misunderstood the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, the Republicans, uh, again, this was earlier. It would be interesting to see this uh, now. And again, these are all Washington state numbers. On the independents, as you might expect, they're more split, but a definite uh, edge toward voting for someone who uh, uh, opposes uh, Donald Trump. So. So w what would be happening is the Republicans are making this, and, and the congressional candidates and the, and the local uh, legislative candidates, they're going to make this a local election. 
they want to talk about Republicans are going to say I get up every morning to fight hard for the working men and women of my district and the Democrats are going to say Donald Trump and the Republicans are going to say we're going to fight to keep Seattle uh, values out of our wholesome district and the Democrats are going to say Donald Trump <laughs> um, so the Democrats are going to try to nationalize the election, the Republicans are going to try to localize it. We'll see how that comes out. Um, over, uh, so, so what, what's your impression of these groups? Uh, the state Democrats, um, the state Republicans, so it's, it's, the blue is strongly favorable, somewhat favorable, strongly on, uh, somewhat unfavorable, strongly unfavorable. So, state Democrats, state Republicans, national Democrats, national Republicans. So, um, you know, you don't get, they don't like anybody very much. Um, they're all, they're all net negatives. But clearly, um, the national Republican is, uh, brand is a detriment here in Washington State. It's Donald Trump's party now. And uh, it, uh, it's not uh, uh, helpful uh, for Republicans to be running in this state with Donald Trump, except in some isolated, uh, or not isolated, but some, some specific areas in the state, legislative districts. So 32% favorable to both, 49% favorable to neither, 10% uh, uh, favorable to the state GOP, but not the national, and 3% favorable for the national, but not the state. So it, it's just the, the national brand is not a uh, flag you really want to be flying there. So here's the generic congressional vote, and this is again back in April. 10 point um, advantage to the uh, Democrats, the statewide, who are you going to vote for for Congress, not particular to the, the districts not a big enough sample in the districts to do that. Um, but we can combine the districts. So in the, in the districts that are currently held by Republicans, um, the generic Republican vote is 50%. In the Democrat, these are congressional races, in the congressional districts currently held by Democrats, the uh, Democrat edge is 56 to 29. So you see a stronger um, uh, vote uh, among the, the Democratic, uh, in the Democratic areas, as you might expect. So the, that gap over, uh, narrowed over the summer, but it's starting to widen again, and nationally it's starting to widen again. I think uh, the last time I checked, you know, which was like yesterday, so it might <laughs> change, um, Nate Silver in 538 gave Democrats an 83% chance of controlling the House of Representatives. Um, uh, Senate, not, not so much, about a third chance. Um, but all the Senate, all the national Senate races uh, are within the margin of error, so depends on the wave. How important is it uh, that um, the, uh, the, the Democrats or the uh, that the Democrats or the Republicans, your party, win the election, or win at least one house. Among Democrats, 65% said it's very important that we could capture one house of the Congress. Among Republicans, 52% said it's very important that we keep control. So again, uh, a bit of an enthusiasm gap there. Um, and by incumbent party, again, um, how important is it to win? Um, the Republicans, 40% uh, uh, say it's, it's really important that we win. Democrats, 54% say it's really important that we win. So that's just a measure of uh, enthusiasm gap. So the, um, uh, the legislative races, this is, a little bit interesting, there's a 50%, after the end of the last legislature, 50% of folks were fairly satisfied with the legislature. In, in a generic um, legislative vote, 
um, in April, 46 to 37, to, uh, edge to the Democrats. Uh, that, again, that's just a statewide. And of course, legislative districts get decided by voters in legislative districts. So the generic vote is only an atmospheric uh, change. It looks at the climate, not the weather. Um, so in districts that are controlled by Republicans, uh, there's a there's a 12 point edge uh, in the generic vote. In districts that are controlled by Democrats, much larger edge for the Democrats. And interestingly, in the in those mixed districts, there's a slight edge uh, in the re uh, Republican districts. Uh, so big majority in the Democrat districts. No one no Democrats are in trouble. Um, uh, no majority in the Republican district, so a lot of Republicans are in trouble. And a slight majority in the mixed district, so maybe they're not in trouble. And so it, it, we just don't know. Looking at some analysis after the uh, primary, uh, looking at the votes and the incumbents and, and all of that, um, this was uh, in Crosscut. Um, uh, they were uh, saying estimates as high as Democrats taking 20 seats in the legislative, in, in the House, in the State House, and as many as five in the Senate. I might be a bit rosy. But it depends on the wave. Um, so the Republican advantage in this legislative vote, uh, in my generic vote, Eastern Washington in all, in all Republican districts, among men, Pierce County, people with some college, Independents, people in Trump districts, and people in swing districts, Republicans have an advantage from eight points to two. Demo the Democrats' advantage, they have a 68 point advantage in Seattle. Net advantage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 35 uh, in all legislative, uh, all Democrat legislative districts. 26% among women. This was in May. I'd be surprised if that weren't higher. Uh, 24 among people over 50, among college grads, among Clinton districts that Clinton won, among voters who make under 75,000, and you'll notice among voters who make over 75,000. Uh, so it's only voters who make exactly 75,000. Uh, along the coast, high school um, educated folks, King County, everywhere else. So um, it, it, this looks, all of these things look like um, a way of coming, but in the in the primary, um, uh, the, the difference between the primary and the general will be between statewide will be a half a million to a million voters, a million more voters potentially in November than in August. So who are those people, and what are they going to do? A wave is essentially defined by new voters coming in, those primary voters, and the undecided voters all deciding and all mostly deciding in the same direction. That, that will uh, determine whether there's a wave election or not and whether, whether the wave goes over the blue, over the red wall. Because a blue wave in a blue district doesn't change a thing. So it, it's going to be this district, uh, for, in the congressional area, the, the fifth district, the three that everyone's watching, the fifth, the third, down and along the river, Clark County, and the 8th District, which is goes from Auburn to Wenatchee. Um, and right now, again, this morning, the, the handicappers are look, looking at the 8th District as a true toss-up with a one-point edge to the Democrat. Um, the 5th District still uh, uh, Morris Rogers to lose, and same with the third district, still pink, um, uh, but uh, all within. None of the, it's all like uh, the odds are like two and three. So say that again know. about the fifth district. Did you yeah. say Vic Morris Rogers to lose? No, did I say that? Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. No, it's two to lose. Two lose. It's, it's, it, it's oh, her it's district to lose. Okay, got it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's about it's it's between. 65 and 75 percent chance. So you know, it's like yeah, I make three out of my four field goals. <laughs> There's always that four field goal. So that, that's what we're all waiting to see. So let's uh, quickly. I want to do this. Um, 
Oh, yeah, well, I think I talked about this. The enthusiasm gap uh, is an advantage to the Democrats. Um, all these, all these uh, uh, issues uh, lead to the Democrats. So what lies ahead? What, let's, let's, we're on a campus. Let's look beyond 2018. Um, so here is our, our, our congressional maps in, uh, of uh, Washington State. Uh, between um, the last census and the next census, there will be 700,000 more people in Washington State by 2020 than there were in 2010. <clears throat> Two-thirds of that growth is going to take place in King Pierce and Snohomish County. And half of the rest of it is going to take place down in Clark and up in Thurston County. So these current legislative and congressional districts are good for maybe another session or two. And then they're going to do redistricting. And inevitably, given this, there are going to be more legislative seats in Puget Sound than there are now. The congressional districts are likely to migrate west. I think you'll see the third and eighth maybe coming back over the mountains. And um, the fifth going more toward the back toward the Tri-Cities. I mean, I, I'm not the map drawer, but just the way the population is going to break out, uh, uh, that's what it's going to look, what it seems to look like. Um, this, this growth in the 700,000 people, in 2016, there were more housing starts in the city of Seattle than there are households in 19 of Washington's 39 counties. Um, 20, 14 of those counties are in eastern Washington. And that's just housing starts. Um, so, um, the, the, and, and the Republicans this year in the, in the legislative as a general strategy uh, have been running against the city, uh, talking about the Emerald Curtain. Um, so, um, I just, as I said to them uh, uh, earlier this year, doesn't seem like a great strategy. Um, at least not uh, long term. The, 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 the increasing population is favoring the cities and the suburbs. Meanwhile, the attitudinal questions that I looked at are migrating out into the uh, suburban population. So the an, an, an Emerald Curtain strategy will um, seem to me uh, further isolate the Republican elected, holder, elected office holders in rural areas. Um, the uh, Republicans used to, well I can rem I'm old enough to remember when Republicans had most of the legislators in Seattle. Uh, but you don't have to be that old to remember when they, they had most of the legislators in suburban King County and suburban but now um, there's only like four or five legislators in suburban King County that are Republican. And um, so unless the Republicans rediscover how to win in the suburbs, um, and I guess on the other side, unless Democrats figure out how to win in exurban and rural areas, then these these uh, parties uh, are going to uh, calcify uh, into the, the, uh, the cascade curtain, the urban-rural divide, and paralyze our politics for uh, you know another generation. So, um, and and we'll see if it, it would it would solidify this if it if it becomes a wave into a sea change in Washington State with the Republicans uh, in rural areas and in the minority in the legislature uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the voters are going to decide here in um, 45 days or so and um, I'll, uh, I'll be glad to come back and deny I said any of this. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes for uh, questions. Maybe I'll start you off. You know, in the 2016 election, there was a lot of talk about the hidden Trump vote. There were people who, uh, who 
didn't want to admit they were going to vote for Trump, but they did, and, yeah. and that's why the polls were off. Yeah. Uh, do you see any possibility of that in the midterms of you know being transferred to uh, candidates who support Trump and, and voters maybe not wanting to admit they're going to vote for him? Yeah, I think that I think that's still a, a possibility. I don't know how large that would be, but um, um, the. Uh, one of the things about the, the, the polls in 2016, the national polls were right. They were spot on. Uh, uh, the, the state polls, most of them were right. The ones that were not right were in the area, those three states that swung. You know, Trump won by 70,000 votes in 10 counties um, in, across three states. And um, that's pretty hard to, to poll for. But, I, I think there there is uh, a growing concern in in my field about uh, you know are people forthcoming? Are we still are we still able to, to do that? And I guess we'll we'll know again when this year comes out. But I, I think there's, there's definitely a, a, a seem like a strong possibility that, that people who are uh, Trump supporters, maybe particularly in Washington State, aren't except in, in some areas aren't very, want to be very vocal about that. What is the follow-up to that? In general, do you find people more or less willing to participate in surveys than they were in the past? Uh, less. Um, the response rate uh, has declined, certainly over my career, um, uh, to, uh, everybody's, everybody's got voter, uh, you know, caller ID now. So, can't trip them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I try to get the call center to see if we can send it out and just say mom on there. <laughs> uh, but it, it has gone down. What, what, what hasn't happened yet is the difference between, there's been a lot of studies about this, as you might expect. Most of the, the most of the conversations around APOR, the American Association for Public Hearing Research, over the last few years has been about this issue uh, and the advent, advent of cell phones. But, but what hasn't happened is that the so samples we're getting not being representative of the other samples and the larger population. Those, those uh, misses last time, which was really, again, I, I don't want to stand up here and be defensive about the polling industry because I'm not. Um, but a large part of the uh, misinterpretation last time was uh, was that was interpretation of poll. You get a poll that says it's it's within the margin of error. Well, that means it's within the margin of error. But when people interpret that to say, well, she's got a two point lead, so she's going to win Pennsylvania, or uh, <clears throat> that's just not the case. And, and um, uh, so <coughs> that. Uh, as much as anything contributed to this mythology that the polls are always wrong. They have been. So, so I'm, a, I'm a rural sociologist and a Democrat, and this is very depressing. Bill Grant was the last guy that ever really represented me in the state. Yeah. My, my question, though, is an interesting argument about the anger in rural communities. Is it about culture or is it about economics? Uh, there's been some books published and right. arguments. Do you have any data that helps to sort that one out? Well, you're going to. You're asking me that. Um, uh, well, I, I would again. I point to Kramer's book. You've probably read it. Um, uh, that seemed to, certainly they're interrelated, and the rural areas, no question, are having a tougher economic time. And Trump won the economically uh, less less fortunate counties in Washington State and across the country, um, but the. So a lot of the evidence is that it is cultural, and that it, it becomes um, uh, that they, they don't respect uh, our culture in the rural areas, they don't respect our way of life, um, and that becomes real personal. And in, in uh, the politics of resentment, that book, that's where she comes down. It, it, it becomes real, real personal. Real and, and then that actually goes deeper than economics. That, uh, and that's, that it gets, gets beyond the realm of politics 
to really solve, at least in any short term way. You know, how do you how do you get out of that? Um, and that's the other question that that we don't know looking long term. We all kind of agree, even with different perspectives, that we're in kind of a mess now. But it's not clear how it resolves, or how we get out of it, or what it's going to look like ten years from now. It's not clear at all. I was just wondering, um, are there any ways in religion to like make um, people be more responsive and more honest in polls? Because right now, I know a lot of times there's a lot of like shade thrown on them, and they have almost a neg negative connotation sometimes. As, oh, there's no way they could be accurate. Are there any ways to like change the culture of that? Well, there's, there is uh, certainly a lot of work done in, in the industry, in the um, uh, association. The APOR, as I mentioned, uh, which is um, an organization largely of academic and, and non-partisan uh, pollsters, but not entirely. Um, the, the head of APOR uh, a couple of years ago was Don Dillman from this campus. Uh, he's president of the organization. Um, they have uh, started an a, a initiative called the Transparency Initiative to get uh, pollsters to reveal more of what the, how we do this and what the sample was and who said yes and just put it all out there and, and, in hopes that transparency will help increase the credibility. Because there's a lot of shoddy pollsters uh, around. That list uh, on 538.com has uh, 300 plus pollsters, and those are just the ones that publish polls publicly. And of those three, only six got an A plus rating. Uh, so there's a lot of, of uh, people who, who do this that, and a lot of them are, are doing it, you know, uh, a camp, you, know you see campaigns doing it, uh, releasing a poll that's favorable to only to their candidate. A PR agency does it to you know, show a, a, a opinion around an issue they're working on. There's a lot of that. Um, but other than that, it, it is, it's difficult, other than just trying to be more transparent, to change that. First, thanks for being here. It was a really good presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask if you knew in the 5th District what issues separate the Republicans from the Democrats specifically? Um, we did a poll in the 5th District back in uh, May for the for the consortium of local papers. I actually only asked a couple of uh, issue questions. One was gun rights and one was health care. And they both separated the Republicans and Democrats in, in, the, fifth, in the 5th District. Which way did this go? Um, <clears throat> can't remember. Not the Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing that I've seen or kind of noticed over the years is the the Republicans seem to do a really good job at targeting uh, voting blocks. So whether it's NRA members or AARP or these these groups that traditionally vote in very large numbers and they know the power of voting. Whereas Democrats really kind of, it, it, at least in this is just kind of my very uneducated viewpoint, but they really kind of struggle to find those those really deep, you know, uh, those 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 groups that that know the power of, of of voting. And you didn't really talk about it too much, so I just kind of wanted to hear your opinion on, you know, what what can be done in, in, in that area. To, to well, to both work. parties have really discovered social media and and mm -hmm. micro targeting and. Um, you know, this is not on to your question, but exactly, but it used to be that we'd have the primary election, and then for the general, both candidates would try to move to the center. And that's not happening anymore. It's still a motivate your base question. It's get out, identify, and get out your voters, and discourage the other guy. Uh, and that's pretty corrosive to the, to the system. Uh, but that's how both parties uh, seem to be playing now. Um, the, the Democrats have always had uh, better luck in general elections because their voters don't turn out as much in primary elections. Republican voters, as you mentioned, 
uh, there's some specific issues that they are pretty motivated around and they, they stay out in touch with them and make sure they get to the polls. Plus, it's just a demographic thing. I have all due respect, young people don't vote. Right. Um, it, it seems that until you are established in life, um, what, what, what that means, you, you get, have kind of your uh, a career ladder type of job, or you own a house, or you start to have kids, that's when people start to vote. You, you see voting participation go up at about 35. People at 18 to 35, enormous numbers, terrific electoral power, but don't vote. Uh, it's, it's down in the single digits. We, we, we separate to do our samples and so on. We'll look at perfect voters, people who vote every time, likely voters, people who vote three out of four elections, unlikely voters, non-voters. The perfect voters in Washington State, 60% <coughs> of them are over age 50. 60%. Uh, might be higher than that. Um, so on a, in a low turnout election, those folks have an outsized influence. On a high turnout election, it's more reflective of the general population, but elections get decided by them what votes. I think Tom Foley once said that. <laughs> so 538 came out the other day. This is a national question with their Senate uh, map. And yeah. uh, what he said was that, uh, however unlikely, the two paths that the Democrats have to uh, taking the Senate, again, however unlikely. Yeah. One is that the that the wave gets tidal. Right. And the other is more of a state by state, gutting it out kind of a kind of a scenario. Right. Which of those scenarios do you think is is more likely? It it seems more likely that it's the state by state one. But you just waves uh, for all of the talk about the wave, they aren't measurable or predictable till right at the end because they're really decided, determined by everybody deciding, all those undecideds and people coming to the polls and they all lean the same direction. It's going to be very apparent at the end of November. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, there's a, there's a very plausible scenario that holds that the Republicans take the Congress and the Republic, the Democrats take the Congress, and the Republicans gain in the in the U.S. Senate, which would, would make this even more fun <laughs> than it's been so far. So we've got time for one more question, probably. Uh, yeah, I, I was just uh, curious as your, to your thoughts on the 8th Congressional District, the the boot that goes over the Cascade Mountains. Yeah. And since you began the, the talk talking about kind of the cur Cascade Curtain, right. I was just kind of curious as to your impressions of that district in and of itself. It was made after the last redistricting. And whether you see it as kind of an indication that, say, state leaders wanted to try to break that Cascade Curtain, or what it tells about a district that brings together kind of the suburban and rural elements. Well, of the state. you know, at, at the high level, it, it's, it's interesting that that it does that, that it brings together rural and small town and suburban. It, it doesn't get into real urban areas, it skirts around the suburban side of, of the west side. So, I mean, that that makes it an interesting political science. Uh, uh, I think it was drawn to keep Dave Riker in the, in the Senate. Um, <laughs> they, they, when they when they redrew the districts, they first saved all of the, of the, uh, of the uh, incumbents, and then carved out a new district for Danny Heck, and that's how we get to it. And, and and we have I don't we have the the most probably open, fair, and nonpartisan redistricting uh, process in the country. Um, so, but it still works that way. I just I, I just it, it'll be fascinating. I, I um, in his. Uh, statewide elections, uh, Dino Rossi has carried what is in the 8th district uh, pretty handily each time, by like 10 points. Uh, and yet this year, uh, that is a toss-up 
razor edge Democrat district right now. So it'll be we'll be parsing that one for a while. But I don't, as I said earlier, I don't expect it to last in that form after the next redistricting. Right. These polls are available on my website. Um, not this presentation, but a lot of the polls that it's based on, if you wanted to we'll go there. Okay, before I ask you to join me in thanking our guest, uh, let me remind you our next candidates forum is next Tuesday noon here. We have the two candidates from the 9th Legislative District coming, so I encourage you to come listen to them as well. Join me now in thanking Stuart Elway for being <laughs>